in their head. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillsdale Church. Will you stand as we begin our time of worship together? Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you so much for, um, yeah, that we get to come together to worship you. Thank you for this church family. And um, yeah, that, that we're not alone in our pursuit of you. Right now, as we begin our time of worship, I just ask that um, you make your presence known in this place. We thank you that you're already here, but will you just start to soften our hearts right now? to receive your presence. We come here not for our glory, but for yours. We come here this morning to worship you. Come and be with us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Father's in the room. Miracles take place. Cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho walls are quaking. Strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is breaking through.
tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken, no I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love Shame no longer hides a place to hide And I am not a captive to lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind no, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I'm standing in your
to invite our children to the stage for, pow- for children's time, and I want to invite all of you to pass the peace of Christ to someone around you. today. Are you doing good? You know, Valentine's Day is just a few days away, so it's a good time to talk about love. Do you know how many times love is in the Bible? Well, it depends on the translation, but in the New Living Translation, 645 times love is mentioned. That's a lot, right? That tells me it's pretty, pretty important for us to learn about love. So I'm going to need a little help this morning for we have a little experiment I have a heart. Can you see that heart right there? That's our lives without God in it. See that empty heart? That's how our hearts are, empty without God in it. Now color that heart red for me. Can you color it a little bit? We're going to fill it in with God's love. Keep coloring. Keep coloring. You're doing great. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So he loved the world, that's all of us, and everyone who believes and trusts in him. Yep, in just a minute. Okay, ready? So let's put a couple hearts on the side. There you go, for the people. That's perfect. I think you did a great job. The people that are all around us. Now watch what happens when our, hold that for me, when our hearts are filled with God's love. What do you think's gonna happen? If we put our paper towel in this water, you think it's going to wash away? Let's see. Let's try it. So there's our friends all around us with empty hearts, and there's our full heart. What's happening to it when we put it in here? Can you see it? There it goes. Is it moving up? Look at that. The empty hearts all around us are now filled with God's love. See that? So it started with us filled with God's love, and then he doesn't want us to keep it inside just for ourselves. We want to share it with everyone around us. We want to let them know that God loves them too. The week of love. you got to show love to other people. All right, well, say a prayer. Thank you for your help. Those are all red. They're all red. Are you ready? Praying hands. You can, yep. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for these children. Thank you, God, for loving us. Just help us to show love to all of those around us. In your name we pray. 
Amen. All right. Good job, buddy. You ready? Thank you, Christy. Thank you, children. Have a great time in Power Hour. Good morning. Welcome to Hillsdale United Methodist Church. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning as we come together as the body of Christ. Um, thank goodness it's not snow. I will take the rain. I'd like to see the snow too, but I don't want to have to drive in it. <laughs> and so um, I want us to spend a little bit of time this morning praying for the 28,000 plus people who have perished in an earthquake. And I wonder if we can just take that time right now to, to center our hearts, to spend just a few minutes silently praying and lifting up those families, and then I'll close us in prayer. Would you do that with me? Let's pray. Oh God, we can't begin to understand what's going on in Turkey and Syria with the devastation of the earthquake and the possibility of more to come and the absolute horrendous way in which people have lost their lives to this circumstance. <clears throat> oh God, some would call this an act of God. It is not. But it is nature. And it is out of our control sometimes. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that you will feel those who are left behind, family members, friends, communities, fill them with your presence and help them to know the peace of God that passes all understanding. And may this be a time, Lord, for the rest of us to bear witness to your goodness and to your grace and to your mercy into the way in which you will fold all circumstances into your good. We just pray today in the midst of such grief and pain that you would pour yourself into those communities and give them peace. We ask this prayer this morning. In your beautiful and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Such a terrible situation. I know there are heartbreaking circumstances all, all over the world. It, they happen right in our backyard as well. But this is something that uh, we haven't seen the magnitude of and in a long time so please be in prayer for those families and those folks also I invite you to turn in our web page to the prayer wall and look at the names that we've lift, lifted up for prayer there are many among us who need your prayers and are asking for your prayerful support I hope you will do that as you uh, navigate this week ahead of you um, not this coming Wednesday, but the Wednesday after that will be Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the season of Lent in the church. It's when we focus and reflect on Jesus' sacrifice for us and, and how Jesus' love and grace and blessing
have been poured out for each and every one of us. And so we begin on Wednesday night, Ash Wednesday, with a service where we uh, walk through that time of grief and anguish and remember um, what Jesus did for us. And uh, at that service, it's a very special service here in the last few years, even as we've made our way out of COVID, it's been standing room only. So I would invite you to make your plans and come. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, blessing to be a part of that service. Tori and I will be putting the imposition of ashes on our foreheads. You might see that in the community as you walk away, around on Ash Wednesday to your workplaces. But it's just a way for us to center ourselves in thought and prayer and action as we go about the season of Lent together. That's not this Wednesday, but the Wednesday after. I think it's the 22nd. So, uh, Tori is preaching this morning on the Lord's Supper. And you might notice we have the table set before us for two weeks in a row. Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I think we could do that every week and, and maybe be a little better off. But today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper again. And she's going to give you her perspective on this sacrament that Jesus uh, asks us, commands us, directs us to do. And she's using for the scripture today, the Gospel of John. If you want to follow along with me, it's John chapter 14, beginning with verse 15 and reading through verse 21. John chapter 14, beginning at verse 15. It'll be up on the screen for you as well. This is Jesus in his farewell discourse to his disciples. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and, re and reveal myself to them. Would you pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The ushers will come forward. We'll receive our morning tithes and offering. <clears throat> Worthy of every song we could ever sing. we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say
everybody. Um, as Jerry mentioned, we are doing this sermon series. It's just a three-week series called Holy Expectancy. And what we're doing is we are preaching through the sacraments, which in the United Methodist denomination, we believe that there are two sacraments. Um, you might find more or less in other denominations, but here we hold Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, as a sacrament and also baptism. So last week, uh, Jerry preached on communion. This week, I'm preaching on communion. Next week, we're going to preach on baptism, and we'll also celebrate someone's baptism, which is really exciting. But the reason why we split communion into two weeks, um, honestly, you could probably do a two-month-long sermon on communion. But we split it into two weeks because there is this... um, There's an invitation that we find in communion, and then there's also an action piece that we find um, as we go out into the world after receiving communion together. I grew up in a small town, which a lot of you probably know because I've told many stories about 
that small town, and I'm going to tell another one this morning. In the small town that I grew up in, uh, there were lots of churches, uh, lots of denominations, and you would most likely not find any one, any group of people that went to separate churches in the same room, unless you were at the Praises Christian Bookstore, which was the only Christian bookstore in our little hometown. And in a way, sometimes I feel like that little Christian bookstore was even more sacred a spot than any of the churches because people from all different denominations, all different theologies would come there and that's where they'd come to get their curriculums and their Bibles and their study books and their home decor because they had that too. And uh, I grew up in praises, essentially. It was one of my favorite places to go. And I have a story that my mom likes to tell of um, one of the first times I was ever in the Praises bookstore. So I don't re actually remember this happening, but I trust that it did actually happen. Um, I was just months old, maybe six months old. And my dad was on baby duty. And at the time, my dad was in full-time ministry, and so Praises was somewhere that he would go often. And um, he took me to Praises with him. And to set the stage, I'm the oldest so my dad has only been a dad for about six months at this point, right? I imagine he just brought the baby in tow, no diaper bag, no, no nothing, right? We're just daddy-daughter day in praises. He's holding me. He's book shopping. And the unthinkable happens, and something falls right out of my diaper, now, I won't go into details about what the said item was, but I will say that it is something that you would expect to see in a diaper, and every parent hopes that they will only see said item in the diaper. And so something falls out of my diaper, and my dad was unprepared and shocked, to say the least. And so what does he do? He kicks it like a little golf ball underneath a display case and he leaves promptly and so he uh, takes me home I'm none the wiser because I'm a baby and um, he mentions not out of guilt but just out of oh this is what happened today to my mom and my mom is appalled as one should be and she sends my dad back to praises with cleaning supplies in tow, and my dad gets on his hands and knees and finds the, the rogue item and cleans up his mess. And um, while I, I think that that could preach a father going back and cleaning up my mess, that's not the point of this morning. The point is that my dad learned a lesson, and he taught me a similar lesson in the Praises bookstore some four five years later. So like I said, I loved going to praises. And one of the reasons why was because they also sold toys there. And there was something about 90s Christian culture that was just, I mean, borderline absurd. Praises was the only place you could go and there was shelves floor to ceiling full of plushed, talking vegetables that were dressed in biblically accurate costumes only a Christian thing. And all of my friends who didn't grow up Christian, if I mentioned Veggie Tales to them, they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But I loved it. And we found all those weird little biblically centric toys at praises. So I was with my dad. He was looking at the boring books. And I was observing an asparagus dressed as David and a giant pickle dressed as Goliath. And after a while, I made my way to the home decor section because I told you that was a thing there. And there, on, on full display in the middle of it all, was this gorgeous, beautiful Noah's Ark replica. A real wooden ark with tiny porcelain animals positioned around it. And I, I don't know which one of you in the 90s would see something like that and think, yes. This is the piece that will complete my living room. But, but you existed, okay? There were some of you that saw things like that and you thought, this says welcome home. And I saw this, and of course it's not a toy, okay? It's not a toy. 
even though the wooden ark had a, like a drawbridge door that you could open and shut. It's not a toy. It is for adults only. It is a piece of decor. But I found myself drawn to the replica. And so I go and I make sure no one's watching. And I, and I shut the door and I open the door and nothing happens. I don't get struck with lightning. So I do it a few more times. And then my eyes are drawn to the tiny porcelain zebra. And I'm enthralled by the zebra, and I pick it up, and I'm, I'm caressing its smooth porcelain body in my tiny little five-year-old hands. And, and I don't know how it happens, but the next thing I know, the zebra's on the floor, and its head is no longer attached to its body. And I'm horrified. And so I quickly pick up the zebra. I try to stick it back together again. It's, 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 it's a no-go. So I, I put the severed body um, next to the drawbridge door, I toss the head inside the ark and I make a run for it. <laughs> and I get in the car and, and my dad's ready to go. And I will also say that I, I did not get my conscience from my father. I got it from my mother who made my dad go back to praises to clean up my mess. And so we're not even out of the parking lot. And I, I feel so guilty and I don't want to admit what I did. So I find some kind of um, middle ground, and I say, you know, it's so weird, Dad. There's zebra in there. Its head is broken off. <laughs> like, we're talking about the weather. But see, now my dad has three kids, and he knows. When kids start stating random facts like that, something happened. <laughs> and so he stops the car, and he says, the zebra's head is, is broken off on that, the Noah's Ark display. Yeah, it's, I just went in there, and I found the zebra in its head. And he looks at me and he says, Tori, did you break the head off that zebra? And I said, yes. And so he pulls back into the parking lot and he takes me by the hand and we go back into the store and he grabs the sales associate and we go over to the Noah's Ark and, and he finds the head and he finds the body and he holds it out and he says, my daughter has something to tell you. And the woman's looking down at me expectantly, and I look up at her, and I panic. And so I say, your zebra is broken. <laughs> and she looks at me, and she says, sweetie, did you drop the zebra and break it? And I look at my dad, and my dad's looking at me. And I jump ship, <laughs> and I say, no. No. <laughs> And my dad says, Tori, tell her what you told me. And I said, I found the zebra and the head is broken. And she gave me one more chance. I mean, this is like a, this is like a Peter moment, right? Did you break the zebra head? And I said, no. And I never told the truth. Honestly, my memory blacks out after that. I'm not quite sure what happened, but I'm sure it wasn't good. And I have several memories of those uh, throughout childhood where you learn the hard lesson. And I've told many of those stories here on Sunday mornings where you're going through the growing pains of learning. Um, you learn right from wrong, right? And you also learn the messy gray area of when accidents happen or when you do something wrong but you didn't mean to, but you still have to own up to what you did. And I, I can pinpoint these times um, throughout my childhood where I've learned these lessons, but in all honesty, we're still learning those lessons today, right? I mean, case in point, the story with my dad, like... Messes are made and we have to clean them up. We have to take accountability. We have to ask for forgiveness, which is what Jerry talked about last week with um, this first piece of what it means to receive communion. Communion is all about recognizing that we are imperfect people in need of what Jesus did for us. And it is all about asking for forgiveness. Now, there have been many people who have come through these doors at Hillsdale Church, and not one of them have ever been refused 
communion at the table here. We, we serve communion with an open table. There will never be a time where someone will come through those doors wanting to receive communion and we would turn them away and say, no, you cannot because you're not a member or because we're not quite sure that you're Christian enough. That's not going to happen here. But there is the expectation that every single person who comes through these doors, who wishes to receive communion on a Sunday morning, is doing so with a heart that is repentant. It's the expectation. It's what it's all about. It is the reason why every communion Sunday, every time we're going to receive communion, before we have you line up and decide if you're doing gluten-free or the regular styrofoam wafer, before any of that happens... We pray a prayer of repentance every single time. And repentance is not just about asking God for forgiveness. That's not, that's not the ending of repentance, but there is an action that is assumed. There is an action piece that we must take as we leave this building. See, when I first started working here at Hillsdale, and even before that, I had so many opportunities to work in very close relationship with teenagers, specifically with teenage girls. And when I first got here, I was the youth minister, as Noah is now. And I would get this question all the time, specifically from mothers who would come to me and they would say, I'm worried about my teenage daughter. Can you come and talk to her? Because she is so ridden with insecurity. She's obsessed with what she looks like. Uh, she's only seeking validation from, from romantic partners. And I just, I don't know what to do with her. She's full of, full of self-hatred. I'm worried. I, I'm, I'm scared. She's not going to grow out of it. Can you please come and talk to my daughter? And of course, every single time I would come and I would talk to their daughters or there have been even times when I would go into the schools and I would meet with groups of teenage girls and we would talk about um, the expectations that society puts on us that are evil and disgusting. These messages of, um, of there is morality tied to what your body looks like, that your worth is found and how you present yourself to other people. And, and really, I mean... We would have beautiful moments. I would pray with them. I would give them scriptures. I would tell them, set, set reminders on your phone so that every day um, you're getting reminders that say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God is proud of me. God loves me. And we would do all of this work. But it could only go so far. Because... A lot of those times, those girls were going home and they were listening to their mothers get ready in the morning or get ready for bed at night, looking at themselves in the mirror saying, oh, I've gained so much weight. Oh, I'm getting so old. Oh, I, I, I can't believe how, how dumb I was this morning. I just can't do anything right. And they are watching their mothers give in to the sin of self-hatred. And I don't blame the mothers because as women in society, we are conditioned for self-hatred. We are conditioned to pick our appearance apart until there is nothing left. We are conditioned to be concerned first with beauty and vanity and everything else comes second. And men are too. And it just presents itself in different ways sometimes. This is not, I am not here this morning to rag on moms or, or the way that we parent our kids. I'm just saying this is what I have the most experience observing. But it goes both ways. And the thing is, is that when we think about sin, oftentimes we think about the affair or the gambling addiction or substance abuse issues we think about when we maybe drank a little bit too much too many nights in a row. We think about um, our, our gossiping problem. We think about these really clear-cut issues 
And we like to put sin in a box, but we don't recognize that oftentimes, because of the society or the culture that we grew up in, and it's different for everyone, but we find ourselves in these cycles of thought that are the opposite of what Jesus taught us where we are believing lies about ourselves as children of God, where we are believing lies about other people, where we are believing lies about the creation, the world that we live in and the gift that it is to us, where we are believing lies about who God is and we operate out of that place. And I just gave one example of the sin of vanity and really what it is is the sin of self-hatred that runs rampant in the society that we live in today but there are many of those that we can look at the way that um, men are even socialized to think about women that can get us in trouble too or even a, a clear example is they said something we had that anti-racism training this past weekend, and it was a really illuminating and beautiful time. And one of the things that they do is they take you through all of the history. And it's uncomfortable when we think about the history of the way that people of color have been treated, about laws that have been passed. When we look at the statistics of the way that people of color have been affected economically all over the world, and when they're going through, I mean, it's like hours that we're sitting through looking at, watching these things about the history of it all, looking at the numbers, and we get uncomfortable. The people in that room, we get squirmy because we don't, we don't want to sit in that for too long. What we want is the solution. We want the fix. We want to know, okay, well, what can we do about it? And someone asked the question, why do we go through all of this? We, why can't we just kind of glance? We know it's been bad. We know the history was bad. Why can't we move forward and talk about the things that we need to do first? And the thing that they said was, you cannot change what you don't see. You cannot change what you don't see. And that goes beyond just that training that we had this weekend See, repentance, there's a two, two-fold thing to it. Yes, it is asking for forgiveness. Yes, it is recognizing that we've sinned. But also, it is resisting sin. It is turning away from sin and turning towards holiness. How can we turn away from sin if we have a blind eye to the sin and the, the negative patterns of behavior that we continue to perpetuate in our lives. How can we possibly repent and resist sin and turn the other way if we don't even know the behaviors that we have that are harming ourselves, that are harming other people, that are harming the creation that we live in, that are that are damaging our beliefs about who God is. Now, you might be listening to me and you might think, okay, well, how am I going to know what I don't know? If we are so entrenched in, in, in the world and the way that we think, then how can we possibly turn away from that? Well, I want to bring up this scripture that we read this morning where Jesus is addressing his disciples, and he is saying that he's not always going to be here physically. And Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. A lot of translations say, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And that brings us to the quote that Jerry um, gave us last week, which actually, Jake, I think that slide might still be in there if you could. Yes, worship begins in holy expectancy and it ends in holy obedience. As we come to this table this morning, we come with hearts that are expectant. 
Hearts that expect to be moved, to be changed, to receive the gift that God has given us. And as we exit this building, we leave in the posture of holy obedience. Jesus is equating loving him with obeying him. And we sing songs about our love for Christ, our love for Jesus. We proclaim it all the time. I love Jesus. I love the Lord. I love God. But what does that mean? Jesus is his words. The word of God is Jesus. The teachings that Jesus gave us, these are the commandments that he speaks of. But it is nothing that we can keep or obey in our own power. The key is what he says next. He says, I am leaving you with the gift of my spirit, the spirit of truth, the advocate, the helper. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit that continues and will continue to reveal to us the parts of our heart that are touched by sin, the parts of us that are messy and broken, the parts of us that are seeing the world, seeing others, and seeing God through a filter that is not the character of Christ. And what we recognize when we come to receive communion together is that it's not just an act of remembrance, but it's an act of remembrance that allows us to be moved and transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, I am not saying that you have to be aware of every sin that you've committed in order to be repentant. But what I am saying is that when we are repentant and we are saying, Holy Spirit that lives inside me, that walks among us, that promised to be with me, that will never leave me, would you speak to me and would you show me the things that I cannot yet see so that I might continue to grow in the character of Christ? And if we are going throughout our Christian lives without being convicted, if we are every single month receiving the gift of Holy Communion and we are not growing in our character, or if we are not coming up against things where we're saying, oh, this part of myself does not line up with Jesus. This part of my belief system does not line up with the teachings of Christ, if we are not having moments like that throughout the course of our life, then we're probably not as attentive to the Holy Spirit as we'd like to believe that we are. And so it is the greatest, one of the greatest gifts that we have in Christian community to be able to come together to receive this holy, mysterious, wonderful gift that is Holy Communion together. Where we are committing to a life of repentance. Where we are saying we recognize that we are people with an inclination to sin. That we are easily swayed by the world that we live in. And we are committing to setting our thoughts and our eyes once again on God through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. So once again this morning, we are going to move into this time of communion together. And we are going to be coming down this aisle with holy expectancy, knowing that as we leave, we are committing to leave in a state of holy obedience And before we pray this prayer of repentance together, each of us, I just want to remind you that the ushers will come by when it's time. They'll release you aisle by aisle. You'll come down the center aisle. Those of you on this side of the room will be served by Jerry. Those of you on this side of the room will come down my line. If you... um, 
have a, a gluten intolerance or you'd rather just have the prepackaged one, those are the prepackaged cups with the wafers on the side. Um, and otherwise, you can come with your hands open and Jerry and I will place the bread in your hands and then you'll grab a cup of juice as well. So let's pray a prayer of repentance together. And this morning, I want us to, to not just join in out of the sake of routine, which there's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with ritual, nothing wrong with the comfort of doing something every month. But this morning, I want us to, to focus on the repentance piece, on the gift that it is that God sees us as we are and extends grace and mercy to us. And not only grace and mercy, but that God offers a better way. What a gift it is that God doesn't just look at us and see the ways that we harm ourselves, the ways that we harm other people, and say, all right, you're covered for this week, and I'll see you again next week. No, God says, I see you, I love you, I forgive you. Here is a better option. Let's try that again. And that's what we get to celebrate as we partake in Holy Communion together this morning, remembering the sacrifice that Jesus made for each and every person in this building, each and every person watching online. Let's pray together. God, we come to you this morning with hearts that are expectant, with hearts that remember your goodness and your mercy. And we reflect on the ways that you've met us time and time again in the middle of our mess. We reflect on the times where you pulled us up out of the pit, the times where we thought that we might not be able to go on and you were there beside us all along. And we come to you this morning and we say, forgive us, God, for the ways that we have fallen short of your glory. Forgive us for the hatred that we have perpetuated. Forgive us for, for the times that we've been silent when we were supposed to speak, for the times that we've spoken when we were supposed to stay silent. Would you forgive us for anything that we have done that has not lined up with your character, with the teachings of Jesus? And this morning we commit to being open to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, to turning away from sin, from resisting evil. And we say, God, would you help us? Would you teach us what obedience truly means? Would you open our eyes and our ears? Would you increase our awareness, not only of your Holy Spirit, but of the ways that we are not aligning with the character of Christ. Your conviction that leads to our repentance is a gift that we can never thank you enough for. Would you continue to teach us to walk in humility as we submit to you and to your commands in our life? We ask that you would pour out your spirit on the gifts of, of this bread and this juice. Would it be a holy reminder of the living sacrifice that you made for us? The blood that covers us today, the body that was broken for us even today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night before Jesus was taken into custody, he gathered with his disciples to share a meal with them and he broke bread and he said, this is my body 
broken for you, take and eat. He poured wine and he said, this is my blood shed for you, take and drink. And so it is once again that we enter into this gift, that we celebrate this holy mystery as we receive communion together this morning. So come, the table is open. Spirit, and may we continue to grow in holy obedience, committed to the teachings and the words of Christ, so that we may continue to look more and more like him. Amen.
Happy Sunday, everyone, and we will see you next week.